without any further delay coming to tonight's session on from the front product management lessons from military leadership let let me give introduction to our esteemed and admired speaker of tonight william perkins will is a product leader evangelist and a visionary as a former british uh, army officer he takes a practical and pragmatic approach to leadership and product development he is currently a senior product manager at deliveroo when not developing products he can be found at uh, on his bike or pruning his roses a very warm welcome to you will we are thrilled to have you here with us tonight handing the session over to you well shama thank you so much and it is a, a really a great great pleasure to be here with you tonight this morning this afternoon wherever you are in the world so i um, i hope i can steal some of your some of your time just to share with you a few thoughts that i've i've learned along the way from from military leadership and product management so without further ado let's see if we can auto magically get things going i will look for sharma to wave and say it's not working but otherwise on with the show so military activity takes place on the extremes of human existence within the crucible of war the successes and failures of leadership are brutally exposed and available for study now this is great for us as product leaders because product management and military leadership are actually very very similar which we often don't see in many other industries you know we both need to understand the goal and the context in which we operate we need to have a vision of how we're going to achieve that goal and we need to bring together and galvanize multidisciplinary teams we also need to chart a path through unknown territory whilst maintaining team cohesion and morale through setbacks and quite often defeat now today i want to talk to you about three themes in which we can draw insight and inspiration from that i hope can help us develop as product leaders now if these um, don't make any sense to you now don't worry i hope to shed some light on them in the in the forthcoming 20 minutes or so so leading and not managing taking a condor moment and going on the offensive so before we really really get going i should briefly introduce myself a little bit and perhaps give you sort of a tiny bit of confidence that i know a little bit about what i'm talking about so I joined the British Army in 2010 um, when I attended the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, which is often described as Hogwarts but with guns. Um, but it's sort of more formally the Army's officer school, where it trains its next generation of leaders. I commissioned as a lieutenant in 2011 into the first regiment of the Royal Horse Artillery, and from there served all over the world in uh, well in the UK, in Germany, Canada, the United States, the Falklands. Um, and I completed a tour of duty in Afghanistan in 2013. Um, I then retired as a captain in 2015. Um, so I then went on into product management, working at Deliveroo, which is a food delivery platform started in the UK, um, but now uh, we deliver all over the world. And I very quickly started to see some of the some of the similarities um, coming out here. So anyway, let's let's carry on with the show. Now, I find the the very term product management is slightly misleading as we're not really managers, you know, instead we are, or we should be leaders. Now these two terms are often used interchangeably. And although both are important and they may complement each other, they are really two distinct, uh, two distinct concepts. You know, leaders define a vision, managers execute on it. Leaders make sure the right thing is being done and managers make sure it's being done in the right way. Leaders think long-term managers more on here and now. Leaders influence, managers manage. Leaders take risks and managers mitigate them. You know, this list goes on and on and on. And you know, this isn't particularly revolutionary stuff. So I don't really want to focus on it too much today. But what is important for us today is to recognize that they are different and require a different skill set. Now, when I look at businesses, I often see leadership as playing second fiddle to management. I did a quick LinkedIn search before this um, for the session, and I found that the term manager returned 243,000 jobs, but only 76,000 contain the, the phrase leader. And then a quick scan through some of these leadership jobs, I saw something, I saw a trend emerging. You know, rather than being at the, the top of businesses or spread throughout the levels, most of these jobs were advertising for team leads and customer service or shop floor supervisors or youth workers, uh, which I found quite surprising. You know, it's, it seems that a lot of the time managers or also expected to lead, but also as a bit of an afterthought. And I think it's down to two things. Firstly, management is far more common in business. And so organizations are structured accordingly. And secondly, the way that we develop as leaders is generally pretty poorly understood. So let's then have a look at this first idea. 
you know, everything needs management. But the thing you're managing does not necessarily have to go anywhere. You can manage a process or a production line. And most things in businesses are processes. But you have to lead somewhere. And this type of activity is more unusual. And so in many industries, the emphasis is, is, is less placed on leadership. But in both the military and the product worlds, we're always on a road to somewhere. And in these contexts, leadership tends to be emphasized in its own right. You know, it's very difficult to work out where you're going, whilst you're also worried about the actual mechanics of getting there, right? You know, it's difficult to drive a car and read a map at the same time. Now, the military recognizes that leadership and management are both full-time jobs. And this is an effective line down which to divide labor. And the military actually structures their organization to facilitate this. You know, the, the lowest level of organization you might find in the military is a section of seven men, which is led by a corporal, but it's managed by a lance corporal. A platoon of three sections is led by a lieutenant, but managed by a sergeant. A company of three platoons is led by a major and managed by a sergeant major. And this pattern continues up and up and up and up the chain of command as the organization grows. And in product management, we see a similar thing, particularly in those sort of more orthodox strands of agile like Scrum, where the product owner, and interestingly, notice how it's not called the manager here, is the leader and the Scrum master is more the manager. They support and complement each other. Often though, as I've said, org organizations are structured to emphasize leadership siloed at the executive level with management below rather than at all levels. The guys at the top make the decisions and everyone else does the work um, the way they say. And as product managers, we often find ourselves trying to lead and manage at the same time. And you know, as we've seen, this is very, very difficult to do both well. And so I think you know, if, if we as product managers in our organization or ourselves find ourselves overwhelmed in our jobs, then sometimes it's quite useful to think about whether we're having to do too much management alongside our leading. You know, it's very, very common. I find this all the time, actually. You know, management is required to keep the train really on the tracks and things moving. And so when there's a choice to drop one, it's often leadership that falls by the wayside. And I find that often I don't even notice the lack of focus on leadership here, here until it's too late. And the roadmap is sort of six, the end of the roadmap is six inches away from my face and I'm out of runway. So in these instances, I like to think about, you know, how do we address the balance a little bit? Can we get informal managers, scrum masters or delivery managers perhaps? Or is there somebody in the development team that I can partner with who can take some of the more day-to-day -day management tasks off my plate and I, can, and I can partner with them? Okay, then, well, let's, have, let's go back to our second point and have a look at how one develops as a leader. Now, Field Marshal the Viscount Slim, who commanded the 14th Army in the Far East in World War II, said of leadership, leadership is of the spirit compounds of personality and vision. Now here he describes character traits rather than professional qualifications, right? In businesses, we don't have a very good framework for assessing or developing character. In fact, it's often assumed that these characteristics are immutable, that some are born to be leaders and others are born to be led. But is this true? Are leaders born and not made? I rather subscribe to the, the Vince Lombardi school of thought that says leaders are made, they are not born. They are made by hard effort, which is the price which all of us pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. Now, saying work hard is a good start, yes, but actually it's not particularly helpful. You know, how do we actually start to apply ourselves to the hard work of growing as leaders? Well, let's turn to the Duke of Wellington here for a bit of inspiration. Now, this painting depicts the Duke following his victory of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. You might notice there's something um, different about the Duke um, to, the, to the officers that surround him. You might need to be sort of um, slightly well versed in Georgian sartorial um, fashions here to notice it. But um, I'll give you a clue that uh, Wellington is the, the bloke in the middle wearing the sort of dark blue frock coat. Now, I think what is interesting here is that he's not wearing a military uniform. He's in civilian attire. And this isn't just a quirk of the painting. This is, this is how he actually fought the battle. This is really odd, isn't it? You know, he's just fought and won the most decisive battle in European history, wearing the Georgian equivalent of jeans and a T-shirt. But I think this actually says something about leadership. And it encapsulates this idea that a leader is actually an amateur as opposed to a manager who is a professional. 
Now, this isn't to say that leaders are amateurish. It's not to say that at all. Leaders should be very, very good at what they're doing. But it's just saying that leadership exists at a deeper level than perhaps the professional. One is a leader first and foremost, and whether they use that in a professional or a sporting or even a social context is almost irrelevant. So then maybe leadership is almost best developed outside of the professional environment, as it is you as a person rather than you as a professional that you're trying to build. Now, when I went to the, uh, the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, I expected to have formal lessons in leadership. Um, in which we were educated in the proper methods and techniques of leadership and, and how to command. But I was rather taken by surprise to find that mostly it was just intense physical and mental struggle that we were put through with an emphasis on a set of values and standards. Um, it was termed values-based leadership. So these values were courage, discipline, respect for others, integrity, loyalty, and selfless commitment. These were the traits that were hammered into us day after day and we were actually judged by. It was really about building the character and the spirit that is required to lead. If you can embody those values, then you could be a leader in whatever, in whatever field you decided. It, it created those amateur leaders that would then become officers. So what does this say for us as product leaders? Well, it means that we can work out our leadership muscles all the time by engaging in activities that build character, that challenge us, that push us out of our comfort zones. And we can do this through physical exertion, sports or exercise, through adventure, you know, going mountain climbing, hiking, wild swimming, whatever, or through perhaps facing one's more professional anxieties, public speaking. You know, one can sign up to do a, to do a talk like this or join an organization like, I think it's called Toastmasters International, where you sort of, you do it almost as a sport. You could mentor somebody, you could teach a non-product person how to be one. Whatever it is that you do though, it's important to do it with enthusiasm, to stick with it. And remember that if it isn't hard, then it isn't worth doing. And I think when you do this, bit by bit, you find that you stand taller, you walk with more confidence, and you become a better leader over time. And so if leadership is different to management, then it perhaps rather sits outside of the traditional management theory structures of maximizing the, the efficient use of time and resources. Perhaps in order to be the most effective leaders, we also need to break away from the constraints that a managerial way of thinking places on us and take a condor moment. Now, in the 1990s, uh, Condor Pipe Tobacco, which you may have only seen if you're in the UK at the time, ran an advertising campaign in which a rather suave pipe smoking gent faced with a series of scenarios that disturbed his peace, coolly assessed the situation and calmly dealt with it in a mildly humorous manner. The tagline ran, nothing should disturb that condor moment. I want to play you an example here, but I've got to warn you that the sound can be quite loud and it is very, very irritating. And also that the comedy is extremely dated and really quite poor, but I hope you'll get the idea. Hey, Will, there's no volume. We cannot hear the audio. Oh. Um, apparently, you can't hear the audio. It's some lads screaming and a boat sinking. And I will do the voiceover. Nothing should disturb that condor moment. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. You, you can um, hire me for voiceovers anytime you like. Now, the military embraces this mantra, and I think so should we. There's this idea that in heat of battle, when you need to make decisions, you want to do so quickly, but you also shouldn't rush into them. Those in command then are encouraged to take that condor moment to imagine that oneself is, and sometimes like actually, lighting up a pipe, relaxing and soaring high above the battlefield like a condor, surveying the landscape, understanding the situation, and just taking a bit of time to think before making any decisions. Now, if anyone hasn't seen The Band of Brothers, then you really should. Firstly, it's a cinematic masterpiece and a gripping true life story, but it's also a wall to wall lesson in leadership. Um, now here we can see uh, the star of the show, um, Lieutenant Dick Winters, the platoon commander um, and the leader taking a really good Condor moment. You know, you can tell by the look on his face that he's, he's thinking hard, 
He's got his cigarettes out and he's even got his helmet off and he's sat on it. He's taken time to properly assess the situation and decide what the best course of action is. But he needs the space to do this. So at this point, the platoon sergeant, the manager, is busy actually managing, managing the platoon. He's making sure combat discipline is being observed. He's redistributing ammunition. He's evacuating casualties. And you can see this divide between leadership and management coming to play again. We need to do this as product leaders, right? We need to detach ourselves a little bit from the day to day so we can take time to understand all the reams of relevant information that are out there, to process it, to come to conclusions that will drive the business forwards. And I think this can mean sometimes adopting some, some slightly strange working practices, which non-leadership people find rather strange and even quite unprofessional, um, particularly managers who like who sometimes think this is like totally insane. Now, when I was a junior officer in the artillery, there was a, there was a colonel who was very, very well respected and loved by all, who, who used to say, if I'm on a golf course, sorry, if I'm on a course, it's probably a golf course. And if I'm at a meeting, it's probably the meeting of the local fox hunt. Now, at the time, I thought this was just a funny anecdote. And it, you know, it was kind of like half true. But over time, I've come to see the real meaning in it. He was talking about giving himself the headspace he needed to do the job of leading effectively. And if you want to perhaps a more formal declaration of this concept, you can, you can find it in um, a book by Major General Paul Nansen um, called Stand Up Straight, 10 Lessons from the Royal Military Academy Santos, who in this guy actually commands the academy at the moment, in which he describes a thing called command time. And he says that you must make time in your day for not actively working, for just letting ideas passively marinate, for taking that condor moment. You know, I find that I do my best thinking when I'm out of my bike, either doing deliveries for Deliveroo or just exercise. And so if that's where I, I do my best thinking, then why would I do more of it? Some people say they have their best ideas in the shower. Well, I would say, great, my advice would be have more showers. Now, there's, there's a certain stigma around this. You know, industrial age scientific management, which seeks to measure and maximize the physical output of each individual, is still the dominant paradigm in business. For us, though, it doesn't matter how many features we build and ship. It just matters that we ship that one killer feature. We should think about how to work smarter rather than harder. And while we're talking about mindsets, we should also think about whether we have a defensive or an offensive mindset. And I want to encourage you to go on the offensive. Now, in most military encounters, you'll find one side defending and the other attacking them. The victor will be the side who can bring to bear the appropriate level of force in order to overcome their opponents. Offensive and defensive operations require military formations to operate with different organizational mindsets. When attacking, command and control should be centralized, and when defending, it should be decentralized. Military doctrine states that for an attacker to overcome a defender, they must have a three to one advantage of their opponent. But in order for an attacking commander to gain this disparity of force, they must centralize command and control so that they can coordinate the simultaneous actions of their forces and direct them onto a single point in the defense to smash through. Now, you just couldn't do this if you let individuals each decide when and where they would attack. The whole thing would just turn into an uncoordinated mess. Conversely, as the defending side does not know where the attack will come from, they need to spread their forces across a wide area and be ready to react to any attack. This is best done with a decentralizing authority and decision making to local commanders, where it is there's just not enough time to wait for centralized command to make decisions, give orders. The problem with being in defense is that you're on the back foot, constantly worried about whether your flanks are secure, where the attack's going to come from, trying to second guess one's opponent. In defense, you're also largely static, which gives the initiative to your enemy. This is why military commanders love being on the offensive. It gets them on the front foot and puts the ball in their court. They'll generally only ever play defense as a means to buy time to communicate, to accumulate sufficient strength to attack. This mantra holds true in all endeavors, no less in product development. A defensive mindset in product development leads one to attempt to cover all bases, to constantly try and match competitors, and to never abandon a feature. But as Frederick the Great said, to defend everything is to defend nothing. In defense, prioritization discussions can become ones of minimizing risk rather than striding towards innovation. A warning sign is a roadmap which has nothing excluded. A bit of everything is covered, but at what overall cost? Conversely, though, an offensive spirit leads one to actively seek out opportunities to exploit, 
to ruthlessly prioritize objectives and to rally sufficient force in order to achieve them. You start to talk about what really matters to your customers. Do they really care about hundreds of these features or maybe just three or four? Look how different the conversation becomes when you go from being on the defensive to the offensive. Defensive says, I have to maintain X and Y features, which means I'll make limited progress towards achieving Z. Offensive says, I will sacrifice X and Y as the customer benefits they provide is outweighed by that which can be gained by Z. And I cannot achieve Z whilst maintaining X and Y. The latter is a bolder, at least a more innovation and ultimately a competitive advantage. Prioritization becomes about what is the most important thing to gain rather than what we worry most about losing. With a defensive mindset, again, companies decentralize the selection of the objective and goal setting. Those decentralized decision makers tend to either select objectives they can easily hit or myopically focus on their own interests that have little relevance to higher objectives. At this point, the higher levels of the organization left little control over the situation on the ground, then obsess about the detail of what their subordinates are doing. This is the point where you know, the long screwdriver of micromanagement comes in as they try to guide all the decision-making in the, in the direction that they wanted to go. But if you go on the offensive, things change. A product leader with an attacking spirit will centralize the coordination of resources, the selection of goals and objectives and inspire people towards them. They give people the why. Once this is done though, and they're rolling forwards, it's time to decentralize the decision-making around the how and the what should be done to those who are actually gonna do the work. Now, the way the military facilitates this is through the commander's intent. The commander's intent is a very, very important thing. As a commander, one should be able to say to those that they're commanding in a crisp, clear manner, it is my intent to do X in order to achieve Y. Now, everybody should be able to understand and recite their commanders and their commander's commander's intent. That way, everybody knows exactly why they're doing what they are doing and can be left to make decisions um, for themselves that achieve that intent. Now, what does this do? Well, it speeds up cycle time, it reduces risk and increases agility. How? Firstly, it speeds up the OODA loop. Now, the OODA loop was initially formulated in the 1950s by the US Air Force to help, to help their fighter pilots overcome superior Soviet technology by making them more mentally agile. But soon this was also found to have applications at a strategic level. And you don't get any points here for recognizing how similar this might sound to agile product development. First, you observe, see what the situation is. Second, you orient, you understand what is happening. Third, decide what you're gonna do. And finally, you act. This cycle is repeated over and over and over. The key to the OOD loop is that when used against an opponent, whoever has the fastest cycle time, or as it is termed, whoever gets inside their opponent's OOD loop will win. As you make more decisions and you take more actions. Now, by giving your intent to your people, you empower them to make more decisions. They are the closest to the action and in the best possible position to observe and orient themselves. And ultimately, they will be the people that will be doing the acting. So why not let them do the deciding as well? Passing decision-making up the chain of command only slows things down and you lose situ situational awareness as you do this. So let people spin their own OODA loops. The OODA loop also reduces risk. The faster you can spin the loop, the more decision cycles you make and the more opportunities you have to course correct. Because as the Prussian Field Marshal Helmut von Mott said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And if we start with this assumption that anything that we plan to do is gonna go wrong, we start to build flexibility into our planning processes. We use our OODA loop to make short-term decisions that are in line with the intent and based on the situation as we see it right now, which may have changed since the last cycle, and we get one step further towards that goal, just one step. If that decision we make is wrong, we've made a bad plan, the damage is limited and we can course correct in the next cycle. So to plan too much too early and to stick too rigidly is to plan to fail. General Eisenhower, I think, had an interesting take on this when he said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So I say, do a lot of planning, but make small plans that can be torn up when proven to be wrong and be prepared to make new ones as you go. So then, if you go on the offensive, give your intent, decentralized decision-making about how to achieve it, 
and let people spin their own OODA loops, then what can you do as a product leader? Well, you can take that Condor moment. You can start thinking further into the future, looking past the day to day. And suddenly you find that you're leading and not managing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real, real great pleasure to be with you today and to, um, to, to whitter on to you for, for probably longer than I should, but I'm, um, it was actually delighted. So um, I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Will, for delivering a brilliant webinar and uh, really great thoughts and thought provoking insights here. So there are a few questions listed in the Q&A window. We can start taking them. Just a quick reminder to the audience. Uh, let me share my screen. Audience, please go ahead and ask your questions in the Zoom Q&A window or on the uh, comment section of LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter, wherever you're watching this webinar from. So uh, taking the first question here, this is from Deepak Gulati. Actually, he has three fold questions. Uh, so if you could just see the Q&A uh, section. Are the, con are the condo moments the same as the strategic decisions made by the management is the first part. Sorry, can you just say that one again, please? Are the condo movements the same as the strategic decisions made by the management? Um, I think that a condo moment could be used to, to facilitate strategic decisions. But the key to them is that you, you take that time out to, to do whatever you need to do, to do whatever you need to think about, be that a strategic decision to try and assess uh, user feedback that's come in potentially to, to reorder things in your mind. The, the really important thing is that you, you do try to take them and you totally shut everything out because you know, if you're trying to make a strategic decision whilst you're on your, like on your messaging service, trying to, you know, sort out your um, product requirements or trying to get your go to market plan going, then that's a thing which takes up all of your, all of your brain power. Whereas actually the strategic decision is the really, really important part. So I would say, yes, it, it, uh, it could be part of it, but, um, but, not, but not solely the same. It, it's more of a, a container that you can put these various things into. So the second part to it is uh, what should be promoted more between features, benefits and advantages so as to be more successful in product launch and management? Sorry, I, I didn't catch one again. Could you just repeat it one more time? Right. What should be promoted more between features, benefits, and advantages so as to be more successful in product launch and management? So I think if I understand the question right, I, I would try to think about what is that, that one thing that you need to ship to make the product successful. In, in the military world, we would describe it, what is the key ground? You know, when, when you give orders in a military context, you say, this is the key ground that we need to take in order to be successful. If everything else fails and, and, and we don't achieve it, that's fine. This is the thing we need to get to. And I, I like to think about that in, in my product management as well. You know, think about what is that one feature where if you didn't have it, it's not going to work. But if nothing else was there, would you still be able to ship it and, and get the value from it? Um, I, th I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, then please come back to me and I, and I can try and clarify. Uh, Deepak, I hope it answers your questions, but if not, then uh, please, uh, you, you, are, uh, you have an option to come online and chat live with uh, William. So you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Meanwhile, let's take this next question. On the war front, it is one enemy and planning could be less complex, not to undermine the risk and pressure. How does it work with many enemies trying to get you off the market? Each adopting a different strategy gets very dynamic. So Roop is mixing the two uh, in the, uh, the sections here, the army and the product management part. So it's a really interesting question, isn't it? When you think about, you know, if you're having to face many, many opponents. Um, I mean, this is probably where the, the military slightly diverges in that, yes, you have alliances, um, in a military context, but generally, you know, they would fight as a block rather than having sort of a more, uh, yeah, a more sort of computer game like King of the Hill moment where lots and lots of factions are all, are all going at each other. Um, I think perhaps in these contexts, you know, having that offensive mindset helps you a little bit rather than thinking about how do we defend against 
15 different competitors um, and thinking, gosh, look, they've got this feature that we want. No, these guys have got another feature and trying to cover all those. Having that offensive mindset, you think, okay, well, what are we going to do? What's, what's the one killer feature that we're going to ship, which the customers want, which is going to set us apart? Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like um, how you claim that, that key ground again. So rather than thinking about what other people are doing and, and, and getting swamped in that, just think about exactly what you are doing, what that key ground is, what your objective is, and, and stay very, very focused on it. Great. Thank you for that question, Bo. The next question being, uh, the, in military discipline, how typically product goals are aligned uh, with entire business vision and mission? I'm sorry, I, I missed the, the very start of that. In military discipline, how typically product goals are aligned with entire business vision and mission? So I think it, it largely depends on, on how good the, the, the structure of the organization is and how well people are expressing their intent. You know, if you have a very well expressed intent right from the top of the organization all the way down, then, then people's individual plans should all bubble up you know, the people at the very lowest level are achieving their commander's intent. And that means that their commander's intents are achieved up and up and up. Um, it's, when that, it's when that intent either starts to break down and is misunderstood or when there is some level in the organization that is not really providing the guidance that things start to go a bit wrong. So, you know, as I sort of mentioned, if everyone's just left to their own devices and say, well, you know, choose your own goals then things really start to become misaligned and you start to find people going in in all sorts of different directions trying to achieve their own goals starting to like look to their own their own promotion prospects should we say um and and things don't really work out very well um so yeah i i think it is really really important and if you don't have that sort of clarity you can try and seek it by asking you know asking the the people higher up in the organization what exactly do you want us to do here you know and I think if enough, you can say, we're not really sure. Can you give us some guidance or perhaps even saying, this is what we think you want us to do. Are we correct? And it can help you align a bit better. Great. Um, that was a great uh, answer to that question. We'll thank you for that. And audience, uh, yet again, I remind you all, please ask your questions in the Q&A window. And let's make the most of the session, the one that we have with Will. Uh, well, there's this question uh, from one of our audiences. Uh, in your career path, uh, transitioning from your army to a product manager now at Deliveroo, what has been your major learning, and how would you put it uh, into a, what do you say into a description where you can uh, help the audiences understand? Yeah, what's been the biggest thing that I've learned? Um, it's a very, very good question. And I think it comes back to my first theme that you should really focus on leading if you are in a leadership position and that trying to do too much management gets you, gets you bogged down. Um, you know, particularly when I started out as a product manager and I still do to an extent, I have a tendency to, you know, get involved too much in the day-to-day, -day, moving tickets about and, you know, trying to, trying to organize story points or, or go to market plans. And actually, that's a distraction from, from what I really should be doing, which is leading the team, explaining to them what we should be doing, where we're going, trying to think six months, a year, three years into the future. That's a thing which I have I've, I've thought of more, particularly in the last, I'd say, three years. And actually, I don't think I was very good at this when I was in the military. I think it's only sort of later that I've, I've really started to appreciate it. Um, there's a very good book, which I think you can only get at the Sandhurst um, like shop, but it's called Serve to Lead. And it, it's basically a selection of anecdotes um, about leadership. I think largely, but not entirely from a, from a military context. And this is found, you can find it on your pillow as soon as you enter the academy. And of course, nobody gets the chance to read it when they're at the academy because they're too busy. But now I dip into it all the time to find inspiration and solace um, because I, I think, you know, I'm a very slow learner. 
And it's taken me sort of this long to suddenly like come, come to the conclusion, ah, okay, leadership is the way that you get things done and not just working really, really hard at the management stuff al alongside it. Um, something else I've also sort of found as I've done more leadership is actually like how lonely a profession it can be. And, and it's important to try and like find, um, find peers and, and friends who are in the same position who you can like talk to about these things. You know, when I was in the army, we had the, the officer's mess, which is, where, which is where we lived, basically. But, you know, in our day-to-day -day jobs, we were, it was quite lonely. We were by ourselves, and when things were going wrong, we were totally by ourselves. But we would go back every night and just talk about these problems and be with people who shared similar, similar, similar situations. And I think that's really important for us product managers as well, because, you know, when the product is tanking, people look at us and, and suddenly it can be a very, very lonely place. But actually, no, we've all been in that situation. In fact, we're probably in it most of the time. And so trying to find those sort of peer groups and, and uh, I don't know, what's it, the modern word for it is probably like a support bubble of people you can like talk about thing, I think is really important. And that, that's something I really want to sort of continue to develop um, well, over the rest of my career. Sorry, that one went off on a bit of a tangent. No, that's all right. I mean, that was great inside, though. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us as well. So uh, we'll move on to this next question from Joseph. How do you create buy-in from your team, developers, QA, on aligning with your thoughts? Unlike the military ranking system being pretty solid on hierarchy. Yeah, so I think, um, I think a good way to get buy-in from them all is to take them all on the journey with you. Um, you know, from the very start, explain to them what your thoughts are. Um, take them to user research sessions, actually get them using the product in the first place, and you know try and get their feedback from it from from a very early from a very early time. And I think there's 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 a bit in here of just like how do you use your innate leadership um, powers almost um, to bring them along? You know, do you have an inspiring way of talking to them? Can you describe your vision in a way which gets them excited? Can you? explain to them how you're going to get there or at least that first step of the way you know i don't think they would want to necessarily know like every single feature iteration that you're going to do but you know roughly we go that way lads um, is, is quite helpful in saying and this is like you know the first step on that road um i'd also say that in in the military the hierarchy is quite rigid but actually when you're in it it doesn't feel quite the same you know when you see it in the film it's all yes sir no sir jumping up and down doing push-ups you know when you when you're there it, it's a little bit more relaxed you know you, you're particularly with the um you know I, I was an officer which was but a very very junior officer and particularly with the the more the very the more senior ncos you know i was a, i was a kid when they were like proper grown-ups and they really they really knew what they were doing they were professionals as i was you know an amateur um and so that, that it does start to break down some of that hierarchy. And just knowing your people really helps. Um, I spent a lot of my time as a platoon commander, like doing things like going around and helping people fix their boilers and, you know, inspecting the dry rot in their, in their military accommodation or taking their wife to a hospital appointment, that sort of thing. I was sort of more of a social worker sometimes. And I think that sort of thing helps you like build a relationship with your people, which, which then gives them confidence in you. And, and then they're sort of happy to follow you wherever you might go, even if, you know, you're going to get that wrong sometimes that they're a bit more forgiving. So I do think that like having a really good relationship with a product team is quite helpful. Um, I've always found that I've, I prefer being embedded in the product team rather than being slightly more sort of on the, on the business side of things and then throwing the, the requirements over the wall to them and, and they can get on with it um, slightly more in silo. Sorry, again, I went on a total tangent there, but, uh, but, uh, but I hope there was some, some answer in there. I'm certain there was, and I hope that answers the question, Joseph. Uh, please let us know your thoughts in the chat window. Come to the next question. Management often leads to micromanagement at times in the general industry working. How do we address this in the context of military workings? Yeah, yeah. The micromanagement thing is, I think, really, really damaging. And, and I think is, um, it shows that whoever was giving the command or the orders or sort of set in direction hasn't really done a very good job of it. You know, they haven't provided the people with a good enough idea of what they really want to achieve. And so 
the the people on the ground who who are like who are being micromanaged have not made bad decisions but made decisions based on incomplete information and and not a full understanding of what they need what they need to be doing so and you know i being being a flawed leader myself i i often find the the temptation to to micromanage say no 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 don't do that and you know and i do do it but i try to take a step back and think okay the reason that you're doing this is because i have failed to really express myself properly and to give my intent in in a way that people fully understand it and understand like what they need to do so you know i i think i think it's from a from a leader's perspective it's good to be sort of slightly introspective like that and to understand when you're doing it but also to encourage people who are being micromanaged when they are finding the long screwdriver coming in to say okay look can you just explain to me again exactly what you want and then that helps them to go back and make in inverted commas the right decision rather than the whoever it is having to come in and say no do it this way or that way Okay, uh, that brings us to the last question of the session. Thank you so much for the participation, audience. But please, yeah, a really great question. Me. Yeah, yeah. So, if you have any more questions, we still have a few more minutes. Please post it in the Q and A window, and we'll take them. So, the ne next question is: By virtue of having roles, designation as product leaders or product managers, are companies defining what is expected of the employee and what uh, they should focus on? Isn't it ideally blurred definition that suits best? Interesting. Sorry, what, what was the, the last part of that? Okay, uh, so uh, I'll just read out again. By virtue okay, of yeah, yeah. roles, designations as product leaders or product managers, are companies defining what is expected of the employee and what uh, they should focus on? Isn't it ideally blurred definition that suits best? It's interesting, isn't it? That I, I do think that our industry doesn't have very good terminology for for you know, for for. A, uh, an industry which prides itself on being very, very specific and and putting a lot of stock in clear language. The, our our job titles are all.